Um, okay, well, I guess we should probably get started. And I, I uh, wanted to uh, thank uh, Dr. Um, Abdul Jafri for inviting me. And uh, also Van Hung has invited me many times in person and I've never been able to do it. And it took a virus and a global pandemic. And then Abdul on uh, Twitter, um, at just the right time asking me and I was like sure let's do it so here we are it's not as good as being in Canada in person but but um, virtually we'll have to work um, okay now let's officially start oh yeah I guess I probably should take a picture this is like my first uh, my first COVID um, virtual webinar through zoom so what a world we live in okay <clears throat> With that, hi, my name is Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm a dermatopathologist and soft tissue pathologist. And today we're going to do some adnexal tumor unknowns. This is um, a lesion right here. We've got a, a nodule in the skin. It's relatively circumscribed, uh, centered in the dermis. And uh, you can see even from low power that it's got clear or pale areas, and then also darker blue uh, areas kind of around the, the periphery and also um, in, in little centered islands here. And here's uh, the second piece. There's some cystic change as well. So in derm path, of course, we always wanna start on low magnification. That's true of all pathology, but especially derm path because you really get an idea of what the shape of the lesion is that you're looking at. Um, okay, so let's, let's go back to this then, all right? So again, from low power here, we've got a lobular neoplasm that's clear and pale in many areas, blue in other areas, and then it's got some cystic spaces. Focally looks like it connects to the epidermis and has some, um, some ulceration maybe. And when we go closer, you can see that it's a clear cell or pale cell uh, neoplasm. It's got clear or pale uh, cytoplasm. Um, in the skin, there are a variety of things that can cause clear cell change. Uh, one of the big ones that people always think of is metastatic renal cell carcinoma, and that's always a good thing to keep in mind. But you have to remember that there are other clear cell things and mistaking um, uh, metastatic renal cell with uh, other clear cell tumors can be a real problem. I've actually seen that happen before where something was called metastatic renal cell. It did have clear cells. Then when they scanned the person, the kidneys were normal. So then they sent the case in consult and it ended up being a clear cell hydradenoma actually, which was great news for the patient, but obviously pretty scary um, in the meantime while they were worried that they were gonna be dying from stage four renal cell carcinoma. So this is not renal cell carcinoma, all right? The, the key here is that we can see the cytoplasm is not just pale. A lot of things in pathology we call clear cell, but what we really mean is pale, light pink. You know, we, we are kind of loose with the term clear. But these are truly optically clear, right? We have white spaces that are empty. They are, they are washed out during processing and staining. And when we see white spaces, and that, that are nice and perfectly circular and that push in an indent on a nucleus, we know that that means that those were bubbles of lipid. They were, they were spherical lipid globules that during processing and then um, the H&E staining process, the lipid washed out and it left an artifactual hole in the cell. So when we see that in epithelial cells, usually we have to think of sebacytes or sebaceous differentiation. When we see that in mesenchymal cells, we think of lipoblasts, right? Those are both cells that have lipid vacuoles in their cytoplasm um, the difference, I mean, if you're a med student or a beginner watching this, the difference is if you see a sarcoma or a sheet, uh, you know, a, a mesenchymal tumor that has scattered cells with vacuoles, then you think of lipoblasts. But here we've got cells with round nuclei that are arranged into nests or lobules. So this is going to be an epithelial tumor. And um, that's how we know that the cells that we're dealing with here are not lipoblasts, but instead they're actually sebacytes. So there's no question at all when you look at this, anyone can say, oh, this is definitely sebaceous differentiation. They really, really look very much like um, the, the sebacytes that we see in normal sebaceous glands. Well, I mean, their, their nuclei are a little different, but the, the vacuolation is the same. And then also what we can see around the outside is we've got a lot of these blue cells. So let's take a closer look at those. The blue cells are, well, the, the uh, scan is not quite as clear right there. The blue cells are round, they're pretty uniform in size, they're hyperchromatic, they have punctate nucleoli in the center, okay? Um, you might look at those and say, well, that's kind of atypical, but these are basically analogous to the germinative cells, the basaloid cells that line the outer layer of a normal sebaceous gland. 
And if you look around, you'll often find uh, mitoses in these cells, even in benign sebaceous tumors, because sebaceous, those cells, their normal job is to divide and grow, right? So they're analogous to the germinative cells of the sebaceous gland, and those cells are normally actively dividing cells. So in this case, we've got a circumscribed tumor. It uh, has relatively uniform basaloid cells, does not have severe atypiar pleomorphism, does not have invasive growth into the dermis, and we've got obvious sebaceous differentiation. So what we're dealing with here is a sebaceous adenoma, okay? So sebaceous adenomas are benign sebaceous neoplasms, and sometimes they're sporadic. Um, in fact, I would say in my practice, probably most of the cases I see are, sp are sporadic, but also in some patients, they can occur, occur in the context of Muratori syndrome. And Muratori syndrome is just a fancy name, basically, for hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome, or HNPCC, plus sebaceous neoplasm. So if you have HNPCC and then sebaceous tumors of the skin, that's called Muratori syndrome. Um, so the reason this is important, actually, is that in patients, um, in certain settings, when patients have sebaceous neoplasms, it may be worth working them up and seeing if they have Muratori syndrome. All right, so the, um, the, uh, this is, there's no doubt telling that this is sebaceous here, um, and this is a pretty good example. And most of the cells are sebaceous with only a smaller population of the blue basaloid cells. So that's when, when we see that, that's when we call it sebaceous adenoma, okay? Cystic spaces can sometimes be seen, and from what I understand, the cystic spaces in a sebaceous adenoma actually are an even stronger indication that the tumor is probably associated with Muratori syndrome. So usually when I diagnose these, I have a little comment that says sebaceous neoplasms are sometimes associated with Muratori syndrome. The question that often comes up is what do we do about this? Do we do microsatellite instability testing? The, um, the PMS and um, all the microsatellite and stable proteins, you can if you want, but those tests are not totally perfect. They can be lost sometimes sporadically in sporadic sebaceous tumors um, and not necessarily indicative of germline. So usually I leave it into the hands of my dermatologist to decide what they want to do. If they request me to do microsatellite instability testing, I'm happy to do it. Um, sometimes they send the patients for genetic counseling. Sometimes they'll send the patient for a colonoscopy. Sometimes the patient's 85 years old and probably there's no need to do that further workup. So I, that's why I leave it open-ended because the dermatologist often has a better idea of what the clinical setting is for the patient and whether or not more testing is needed. So here's a sebaceous adenoma with cystic change. All right, this is a, another lobular tumor, pretty well circumscribed but it's much more blue, right? It's a solid blue lobules in the dermis. Also has some cystic spaces in it. And when we get closer here, we can again see sebocytes. Very nice, vacuolated. The vacuoles are a little more fine and delicate in this case, but you can definitely see nice, obvious sebocytes in here. And then again, these background germinative basaloid cells, which are very uniform, they have small nucleoli. And if you look around, you'll find mitoses. So I feel like in the literature, there's not a lot of discussion about that, unless I've overlooked some papers, that when we're talking about how to tell if a sebaceous tumor is benign or, um, okay, someone said I should give five seconds to give the answer. That's a great idea. Um, I will do that. Um, so if you, um, if you uh, look around, I feel like I see mitoses in almost every sebaceous neoplasm, both benign and malignant. And the way I found that out is I was giving a course um, a few years ago and I was trying to pull examples of benign sebaceous tumors and I couldn't find any examples in my entire recut collection that didn't have mitotic activity. So either I've misdiagnosed a whole bunch of sebaceous carcinomas and called them benign, um, and I'm knocking on wood, hopefully that's not true, or it's just that mitoses are actually present in these cells. So I don't get too worked up about finding mitoses. I do get worried if I see atypical mitoses, like tripolar mitotic figures, or pleomorphism, or infiltrative invasive growth. Those things are all concerning to me. Okay, so then what is, um, I will let you guys decide. We've got obvious sebocytes, blue basaloid cells, and the basaloid cells make up the majority of the tumor, more than half of the tumor, whereas the sebocytes, the mature sebocytes, make up less than half the tumor. So what is the diagnosis? You're welcome to type it into the chat if you want. 
you'll get a, a invisible bonus point from me if you get it right. Um, or you can just quiz yourself and know in your heart the joy of, of making the diagnosis. Okay, I see someone, there we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, this is a sebaceoma. Sebaceoma is basically, in my view, on a spectrum of sebaceous adenoma. So don't lose sleep over deciding whether to call something sebaceous adenoma or sebaceoma. It doesn't matter. They're both benign sebaceous neoplasms. And it's, in my opinion, purely a, an arbitrary distinction that we've made by saying if it's more than 50% basaloid blue cells, then it's sebaceoma. And if it's more than 50% um, are the mature sebacytes, then we call it sebaceous adenoma. Okay, cool. Sometimes in derm path, we like to split a little bit too much. And I think splitting's fun um, for conferences and for teaching, but in the real world, we have to think about what really matters for patient care. And the point is, is that both of these tumors are benign, but have the potential to be associated with um, uh, Muratori syndrome. And uh, Van Hung makes a very good point that it, this is a great time to get the diagnosis wrong. Because A, the chat screen is hidden from the video, so maybe your colleagues will see that you got it wrong. But, um, but no one on the internet will, okay? And um, the other thing that is important about this is that if you get it wrong, no one dies and you don't get sued. And I like to tell my residents that, and it's kind of that I'm joking, but also it's totally true. When you're in training or when you're in a conference, um, it's a great time to look at a case and say, I think this is the diagnosis and to be totally wrong because that's how you learn and how you set your internal diagnostic uh, thresholds. How you, when you look at something and you realize, man, the last three times I saw this tumor, I thought it was benign, but it's actually malignant. Then you learn that's a tumor I need to spend more time thinking about and studying and, and looking at. And I think that's a great, um, a great way to learn. And I actually do that even to this day, even though I'm not a trainee anymore on the internet when people show cases and I say, oh, I, I think this unknown case is going to be this. And then they're like, wrong, it metastasized. It was actually melanoma. I'm like, well, that was a hard case. And it's, it's good to to see what things um, I look at and, and get right and which things I get wrong. This is the way that we, um, that we, you know, we adjust our gut feeling, right? And if you haven't read it, there's a really great book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink. And I think it should be required reading for all pathologists, probably for all doctors, because it's all about how we look at things and make subconscious decisions before we are cognitively aware of it, that there are little, you know, the, the underpinnings of the way our brain works are picking up little details. And so that, that, all of that technical stuff there, I think amounts to what we have that we call a gut feeling. And so I can realize that sometimes my gut feeling is, ooh, I'm worried about this, but it ends up being benign. And if the last 10 times I was worried about something, this certain thing, I realize, oh, that always looks scary, but it ends up not being scary. And so that's how I adjust my, my gut feeling. So in any case, there's a little bit of philosophy lesson for you today, but I think it's a really, a really great way to learn. I still remember cases from residency where I was wrong, where a junior resident told me they thought it was something. And I was like, oh no, no, I'm, I'm the senior resident. I'm going into the path. And oh, no, I was totally wrong, totally wrong. And I still can't get over those things, but I remember, and hopefully that will help me help my patients one day. Okay. Thank you for letting me preach. I appreciate it. Now, this is a sebaceoma. All right. So let's move forward. And by the way, I'm using Path Presenter uh, here, which is a really fantastic website uh, designed by Raj Singh and some colleagues. And you can actually create your own account and upload cases and search from, there's a public library of thousands of cases, and you can build them into presentations. You can actually upload a PowerPoint, which I tried to do this morning, but I was having trouble with them. Um, with the formatting, so I decided to just do cases. So, all right, so here again, we've got a blue lobular tumor, kind of similar from low power to the last case, right? Um, <clears throat> you can see there are some little pale areas here. Um, this is a good example of how not everything that's blue and basaloid in the skin is a basal cell carcinoma. Basaloid tumors, oftentimes we have to think of basal cell carcinoma first because they're so common. So one important thing for people that are not derm paths that are doing some derm path but are, are general pathologists is to make sure that you don't miss something that's not a basal cell and call it a basal cell. That's sometimes that's, that's going to be a real problem, like calling uh, something basal cell that actually is a Merkel cell or some other worse type of carcinoma. And it can happen even to derm paths and to anyone. And so it's, that's one thing I always have to be thinking of because when we look at a melanocytic lesion, we know, oh, melanocytic, I need to be more careful. But the things that we know we need to be more careful about, those are the things that we oftentimes handle at least well enough. We say, well, I'm kind of worried. I don't know. Let's get an expert opinion or something. It's the things that we think are easy that actually are, are not. 
those are the things that really get us in trouble. Those are the pitfalls, right, that we, that we have to always watch out for. So when I'm looking at a blue neoplasm from low power, things that can help me is usually basal cell carcinoma has a unique kind of stroma around it, kind of oftentimes a little bit mixoid and fibrous mixed together. Oftentimes you'll see clefting and mucin right around the edge, even at low power. And so at, at lower power, if I don't see clefting and mucin, um, right away I start thinking this may be something not basal cell carcinoma. Okay, and I've had times where I thought, well, I can't really decide, and, and I called something an invasive carcinoma, and I said, it, I think it's probably a basal cell, but I'm not totally sure. Maybe it could be a basaloid squame or an inexal carcinoma, but, but I don't see any obvious inexal differentiation, and thank goodness I've had times where I did that and felt like I was being overly hedgy, <clears throat> and then the tumor recurred rapidly and was a poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma and was very aggressive. So... <clears throat> especially on a small biopsy, if you're not sure, it's good to be cautious in that area and don't just blow things off as basal cell if you're not um, totally sure that it is. All right, so here we can see we don't have peripheral palisading really, we don't have clefting, we don't have mucin, and so all of those things tell me now we're not dealing with a basal cell carcinoma uh, in this case probably. Let's see if we think that it looks uh, malignant. I think I've got some, let me move my window here. I added uh, some little annotations to help me find the areas I was looking for. Obviously, big, ugly pleomorphic cells. There are also lots of mitoses in this case, but there is definitely pleomorphism here and much more atypia than in the previous cases. So I think what we're dealing with here is a malignant tumor. Now the question is, what kind of malignant tumor? Is it a poorly diff squame with some clear cell change, or is it actually sebaceous carcinoma? And there are a lot of mitoses, yes, as, as someone pointed out. So. <clears throat> that's the, the problem, I think, with, and then here's a big atypical looking mite, right? That's got too many chromosomes, I'm sure. So what do you think? Do you think it's enough? Yeah, so I've seen people answer sebaceous carcinoma. And yes, that, that is my diagnosis for this case. The vacuoles here are fine and delicate. They do indent the nucleus. They are definitely not as, um, as uh, clear and crisp, maybe, as the previous cases I showed you. This is the big problem, I think. Sebaceous neoplasms seem simple at the outset because there's only a few diagnoses. There's sebaceous hyperplasia, which I didn't show you today. I didn't have one uh, handy. Sebaceous adenoma, sebaceoma, sebaceous carcinoma, and a couple of other weird things. But really, there's not a lot of different sebaceous options to choose from. So it seems like it should be um, pretty easy to sort these out. I think that you, you have a problem at both ends of the spectrum. On one end, if you can look at a tumor and say, this is definitely a sebaceous tumor, the question is, is it atypical enough to call it malignant or is it a benign uh, tumor? At the other end, you can say, whoa, this thing's definitely malignant, but I'm not sure if the vacuoles or the clearing is quite enough to be true sebaceous change, sebaceous differentiation, or if it's just clear cell change in a spleen. So this is a problem that I encounter all the time. And we know that this is a problem because people keep publishing different stains to try to identify sebaceous tumors. Um, EMA um, will stain the vacuoles and highlight them. So will adipophilin, uh, which is a stain I don't have in my lab, but I know people that, um, <clears throat> that, uh, that have used that and like it. Um, there are other people who have tried a variety of stains. Um, our group published that um, factor 13A, only a certain clone, the AC1A1 clone, will actually stain the nuclei of the mature sebacytes in both benign and malignant sebaceous tumors and seems to do so in a relatively sensitive and specific fashion. Although after we published that, I've continued to try to use it. And I found a few times where it didn't really work as well as I thought in something that I knew must be sebaceous. And I've also seen it have some kind of wishy-washy staining and squames and other things. So what I've learned over time is that that there's not a perfect one, one, uh, one solution stain to solve these. And so what I do is if I look at it and I decide this is malignant and I see what I think are obvious sebacytes, I may still use stains to help support that um, or to help rule it out. But in the end, I'll say, okay, I think this is sebaceous carcinoma. And if I'm not sure, I sometimes will say um, uh, invasive carcinoma with the comment that this could be a squame with clear cell change, but another possibility that's less favored would be sebaceous carcinoma and that I tried the stains and I didn't see definitive sebacyte differentiation. The point of that is that <clears throat> sebaceous carcinomas, A, can be associated with neurotory sometimes, particularly when they're away from the head and neck. If you have a sebaceous carcinoma 
on the body away from the head and neck, most likely that patient is Miratori syndrome. On near the eye, which is a very common site for sebaceous carcinoma, most of those are not associated with Miratori syndrome, actually. They're, they're important to recognize for a different reason, though, because sebaceous carcinoma is right near the, in the ocular area, as opposed to, say, squamous cell carcinoma. They have a real tendency to spread back into the conjunctiva. And so from my um, ophthalmic surgery colleagues, they, they've told me, yeah, we really need to know when it's a sebaceous carcinoma near the eye. They'll often do scouting biopsies of the conjunctiva to see how far the pagetoid spread is extended back around the eye. It really, you know, really serious uh, situation for the patient there. So, <clears throat> so that's an important thing to keep in mind. So uh, that, I think that this case though fits pretty nicely for sebaceous carcinoma. It's definitely got enough atypia in my opinion, and it's got cells that I believe are convincing uh, sebocytes. But you'll definitely find that this is a subjective area and people can have differing opinions um, as in much of derm path, but especially I think sebaceous tumors. So, so they seem simple at first, but the more I do them, the more I, sometimes I throw up my hands and I say, there's no truth. There's no, I don't believe in sebaceous tumors anymore. And then my fellows laugh and tell me that I'm, I just need to calm down and go home for the day and I'll be fine tomorrow. And usually I am. All right. <clears throat> so here's a uh, dome-shaped papule. And, and how can we tell it's dome-shaped? Well, look, here's where the normal skin is, right along here. And we can't see the normal skin over here, but it probably would have gone right around there. So this is like a, a papule, it's sessile, kind of pushed up and almost polypoid, but with kind of a flat base. And... Um, you can uh, see basaloid islands in the middle here, some cystic spaces filled with keratin. So again, the first thought you might think is basal cell carcinoma, it's basaloid, right? But the stroma here is quite different than basal cell carcinoma. The stroma here is very pink and collagenous and relatively cellular. It's got a lot of, uh, of kind of plump fibroblasts that are, are filling in the space between the collagen. And something that the, the, the stroma is doing here that is unusual for basal cell is that the stroma is wrapping closely around these basaloid islands. They're tightly invested in this stroma. Whereas in a basal cell carcinoma, the stroma tends to separate away with that cleft filled with mucin. Um, and uh, we, that's a, like a, why I really like the clefting um, and mucin filled spaces as a really supportive, helpful sign for basal cell uh, carcinoma. So when I see a, a pink kind of cellular spindled stroma, um, in the setting of a basaloid tumor, I instantly start thinking, could this be a benign hair follicle tumor? So that to me is one of the most helpful clues is seeing that and the lack of the mucin filled clefts um, that makes me start thinking of uh, a different type of, of hair follicle tumors, okay? And then the best thing though, and you don't always find it, but when you do, it's great, is this right here. So what is this, this structure called? And this one? And this one, does anyone know? I'll give you a minute to type it into the, yeah, there we go. Papillary mesenchymal bodies, exactly. So what these are, these cells look round, but if you do a keratin stain here, they're gonna be negative. They will be negative. These cells, the basaloid cells are keratin positive, but these cells are actually stromal cells. And yeah, you can use uh, CD10, CD34. There are different things to highlight some of the different cells in, um, in uh, follicular neoplasms. But usually with practice, you can just tell by looking at them, I think, on H&E much of the time. So these cells, though, are actually these kind of oval to round stromal cells, and they're clumping up and aggregating next to the basaloid nest and they push in and kind of invaginate and push into the nest of basaloid cells. When I find that, I think that is the most helpful slam dunk feature to support a benign hair follicle tumor, such as trichoepithelioma, as someone uh, pointed out in the, the chat box. Good. So yeah, I would call this a trichoepithelioma. And I will show you these papillary mesenchymal bodies, they're analogous to the hair papilla. So what's a hair papilla? It is find it. If we go find a normal hair, in this case, this is a little baby vellus hair, a tiny hair. Look at what's happening down here. We see these spindle to oval to round stromal cells, and they're all clumping up and clustering right underneath the blue basaloid cells of the little hair root, the hair germ cells. And if you look down at big, deep antigen hairs, the big hairs that you see in the scalp, look way down in the subcutis, you'll see the same thing happening. You'll see them actually pushing all the way in and forming a little bulb or a little, a little like round structure that pushes into the hair root. And that's where the, there, there are cells there that basically control and regulate growth of the hair follicle. 
But what's happening in trichoepithelioma and other hair follicle tumors is that you're getting, this is getting recapitulated by the tumor. And these structures are get, get more pronounced and we call them papillary mesenchymal bodies. The other thing is that if you look at normal hair, um, hair uh, follicle, and I wish I would have put in a, a slide with that, but a normal hair follicle usually has its own little layer of dense collagen and um, spindle cells that wrap around the hair follicle. And we call that the adventitia. The stroma of hair follicle tumors is similar and analogous to that adventitia. It's like the same kind of cells and collagen, just a lot more of it. So again, that's what I kind of like about, about hair follicle tumors is that they are, are resembling the different normal parts of the normal hair follicle. And normal hair follicles have a lot of different parts to them. And it was one of the last parts of normal skin uh, microscopic anatomy that I actually was able to learn. It took me a longer time to master that because there's so many different layers and it changes at each level as you go from the root up to the top of the hair follicle. So how do you decide to call it trichoepithelioma? Well, trichoepitheliomas tend to be small and, and centered in the dermis. They oftentimes connect up to the epidermis or connect to normal hair follicles. They oftentimes have cystic spaces filled with keratin, like so. And sometimes you can even see little bits of hair shaft in there too. And um, <clears throat> there are some people who say, well, there's no such thing as trichoepithelioma. They're all trichoblastomas. And again, this is one of those times where we're making, up, we're making distinctions about what name to call thing, and it doesn't really matter. A trichoepithelioma is a benign hair follicle tumor. So is a trichoblastoma. So whichever name you want to call it, it doesn't matter. I, I, my understanding is that Dr. Ackerman, Bernie Ackerman, I think he didn't believe, I hope I'm not, not uh, misquoting him, but I believe that, that he didn't, didn't like the term trichoepithelioma. He thought these were just a variant of trichoblastoma, which they very well probably are. I think they're all on a spectrum together. Um, so in a, again, at, when I teach, I like to split, but in real life, I'm a bit more of a lumper where I, I lump things together. If they're all benign and, and hair follicles, then whatever name you call it is not really that important um, as long as the dermatologist and the surgeon knows how to treat the patient. So to me, when I find good stroma like this and papillary mesenchymal bodies, I feel comfortable saying this is a benign hair follicle tumor. There are some people that believe that there are variants of basal cell carcinoma that can have papillary mesenchymal bodies. I, I personally don't hold to that view. I've never seen a convincing case of something that I thought was truly a basal cell carcinoma that looked like this. I have seen rare examples in people with uh, unusual syndromes where they have a lot of adexal tumors. I've seen rare examples of carcinoma growing out of a benign trichoepithelioma or trichoblastoma. In those cases, one part of the tumor looked benign and the other part looked malignant. So it happens because it's very rare though. So the, the bigger problem is when they look like this, it's great and everyone can be happy, okay? And also it's great when this is from like a young adult, but what if this is from an 80 year old person with sun damaged skin? And you're really worried it's a basal cell carcinoma. Well, if I've got a good biopsy and it looks like this, I'm still comfortable calling it trichoepithelioma. But in an older sun damaged person, it's got to be perfect trichoepithelioma for me to say that definitively. The bigger problem is a lot of times we'll get a shave biopsy, you know, like this. And we'll get some basaloid islands and I get a little bit of that stroma and I think, well, that could be a trichoep, but I really can't see the whole thing. And it's on the nose and they're old. So do I send them for Mohs surgery or do I say, leave it alone? You know, I don't wanna be wrong in either direction. I don't want them to have surgery on their nose or, or their eyelid that they don't need, but I also don't want to, to blow it off and then it cause a bigger problem. <clears throat> so in that setting, if I'm not sure, I'll say this is a basaloid neoplasm. And I, I say that I can't tell for sure, but I favor that it's a benign follicular, but it's you know part of a bigger lesion. If it persists, they might need to go back and take it out. Sometimes the dermatologist will say, I wanna just take it out anyway. The other thing you can do is there are a variety of stains that people try. Someone mentioned FLADA1, P-H-L-D-A-1. I've never tried it. I've read papers and the papers look really good that it's very strongly helpful in distinguishing basal cell carcinoma from benign hair follicle tumors, but I don't have it in my lab yet, so I don't have any personal experience with it. Uh, the other thing, the one thing that I've, I have found to be helpful in this setting, um, because most, most of the stains that are reported are a matter of, well, there's more staining here around the edge of the tumor and less around the middle, or this is stronger or weaker. And I feel like those kinds of stains are very subjective to interpret. And I like stains when I'm using a diagnostic stain to help me tell benign from malignant or something like that. I want a stain to be like, this is strong diffuse positive, that or totally negative. Obviously, that's the most ideal situation when we can have a stain that's really binary like that. 
So the, I try to always look for those things. So one thing I have found helpful though is cytokeratin 20. CK20 will tend to stain Merkel cells, passenger Merkel cells that are scattered and hanging out in the midst of these basaloid islands. They'll be kind of scattered all throughout um, the tumor. And that's a common finding in benign hair follicle tumors, but usually is absent in basal cell carcinoma. So sometimes I will do that and do a cytokeratin 20 to see if there's scattered Merkel cell passengers. And again, that not Merkel cell carcinoma, we're just talking about normal Merkel cells that live sometimes in the basal layer of the epidermis. They also live in hair follicles and hair follicle tumors tend to have um, a, a little group of passenger ones hanging out in the midst. I think I've tweeted a picture of that before, if I recall, maybe not but I don't have it handy right here. So I'll, I'll have to pull that up and show you later. Again, look, another closer view, papillary mesenchymal bodies. See, this is the island of epithelioid, bas the basaloid epithelial cells. This is the papillary mesenchymal body. And sometimes they're very subtle and you, they don't make a perfect nodule that pushes into the island. Sometimes they just clump and cluster. So with practice, you can begin to recognize them. Here's a papillary mesenchymal body too. You can barely see there's a little tiny wisp of the basaloid island. Basically, you're getting this structure here, but cutting it at like an angle like that. So learning to see in three dimensions is, uh, is a tricky thing to do, particularly in hair follicle tumors. But with practice, you can begin to recognize it and you'll get a feel and say, oh, that's going to be a papillary mesenchymal body. All right, we've, we've talked enough about trichoepithelium. Um, move this around, there we go. So here's an excision from uh, the face. How do we know it's from the face? It's really useful, I think, to look at um, skin biopsies cold, like that is with no information. And I tell my fellow, don't tell me where it's from or the history or anything and see, can I figure out where it's from in the body, how old the patient is, all of those things. It's A, it's good for, for teaching, um, teaching yourself um, uh, to recognize the different types of skin on different parts of the body. Also, it can be helpful that sometimes if I look at this and someone tells me this is from a, a 10 year old's foot, then I know that we have a swapped specimen or the paperwork's wrong, right? There's no way this is from the foot. There's no way this is a 10 year old because very good, someone picked it up. There's skeletal muscle, even from low power, you saw that. Bravo, Kevin Coat, you get a bonus point, good work. Yes, yeah, skeletal muscle bundles right here in the subcutis and even up in the dermis is something that you see on facial skin or on the neck. The muscles of facial expression, I'm working to not touch my face to not you know, get coronavirus. And then also the platysma muscle on the neck, they tend to get the little fibers, get up very superficial and can be in the dermis or the subcutis, okay? So when you see that, that's helpful. Also on the face in, uh, in adults, particularly older adults, you tend to have a lot of sebaceous glands, real prominent ones, particularly like the cheeks and the nose area, the oily areas of the face. And then also we can see that the dermis, instead of being pink, is gray blue. This person has been out in the fields or on the golf course for many, many years. This is an old person who has had a lot of sun damage. The dermis should be filled with reticular collagen uh, fibers. Uh, the reticular dermis should have pink collagen bundles, but instead most of it's been wiped out and replaced with solar elastosis. I'm not sure if you see solar elastosis this bad in Canada, but where I live in Arkansas, where we got a lot of old folks with, with light pale skin, we see tons of this. This is like, this is basically normal skin for over half of my patient population. All right, so this is from the face. And here is the lesion. You can see this lesion right here. And how do we tell, we can tell that this is a lesion right away because this is my internet connection's unstable. So if my audio is going out, you can just type in there and let me know. The, um, you can tell one thing is, look, the elastosis is gone. It's been replaced by pink collagen and some little islands of basaloid cells. And you can see that pink collagen is pushed down here into the, just the very top of the subcutis. These things that look like black are actually calcifications. They just didn't, they didn't show up quite right on scan. They look black, but they're actually purple calcifications. And then we see these little thin elongated cords and islands of basaloid cells that have kind of uniform cytology. They all look like each other, don't look very atypical. There's a dense co uh, collagen rich stroma. There's some cysts filled with keratin. There are some granulomas with flakes of keratin. So these are from the cysts that rupture. And so anytime we have little keratin cysts, it's to in any sort of lesion in the skin, 
it's a good chance you're gonna start finding some little clustered carrots and granulomas. You don't need to go do a fight stain or uh, a fungal stain for this. This is keratin, okay? There's little flakes of keratin right in those spaces. All right. And the tumor cells here are, are these, these long, thin cords. So anyone wanna take a stab at what this uh, entity might be? There's a few different options. Okay, I'm seeing desmoplastic basal cell, desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. And there are, yeah, there are two more things you could potentially put in your differential. And MAC and syringoma, good. And MAC stands for microcystic adnexal carcinoma. So those four um, things, um, morpheiform, sclerosing, infiltrate of whatever name you like, basal cell carcinoma, that's one. Syringoma is two, desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, three, and microcystic adnexal carcinoma, or MAC, is four. Those four things make up what we call the, the tadpole or paisley tie differential. They're tumors that tend to make little islands that have little, little elongated tails and that sometimes have a tadpole-like shape. Let me see if I can find a good tadpole shape for you here. That's pretty good, I guess, right? It's kind of got a little head here and then a little tail uh, behind it, okay? Yes, we can add more feiform basal in the differential diagnosis. I, I personally use the term basal cell carcinoma, comma, infiltrative type to encompass micronodular, more feiform, sclerosing, all of those different types of basal. I just lump them all under infiltrative when I sign them out uh, in my pathology reports in real life. I know some people who don't like to do that, and that's totally fine. But yes, Basal cell carcinoma has a type where it gets little thin elongated cords, and that's one of the things in the differential here. Okay, sorting this differential out can be challenging. I think basal cell carcinoma and syringoma are usually the easiest ones to rule out first. Most of the time, if you get a big enough biopsy, a morpheiform or in infiltrative pattern basal cell carcinoma will have some little cords like this, but it tends to have a different stroma. The stroma is not as pink and collagen rich usually. It's usually much more cellular and, and bluish mucin rich or mixoid for pathologists. Sorry, uh, in derm, dermatologists use the term mucin to refer, refer to hyaluronic acid and glycosaminoglycans. And pathologists use the term mixoid to refer to that. And I straddle both worlds. So when I use mucin, I mean mixoid and vice versa. Okay. So I'll try to, I'll try to remember to, to point that out. But usually you have a, a kind of a cellular spindle cell rich stroma in, in, in the infiltrative forms of basal cell carcinoma, and it has a bluer tinge and less pink. Now that's not always true, especially if you have a scar from a previously treated basal, and now you're having a recurrence into the scar, it can have dense collagen in the background. But the other thing is that basal cell carcinoma usually will have at least some areas that have bigger nests that look more obviously like basal cell carcinoma, okay? If you get a big enough biopsy. Syringoma is easy because it almost always right away has ducts. You'll see these little tadpole shapes, but each one will have an obvious duct. You don't have to look around to hunt for ducts. You can see obvious sweat ducts in each little area of the tumor and the ducts are, are multiple and abundant. So usually that's really easy. You see a bunch of ducts all the way, uh, these kind of little tadpole shapes with a bunch of sweat ducts in them, then you're dealing with the syringoma most likely. The, different, the differential that's really hard to sort out though is desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, which is what this is here, and microcystic adnexal carcinoma, MAC. The distinction is very important because desmoplastic trichoep is a benign tumor, and MAC is a locally very aggressive, locally aggressive tumor that often requires pretty significant surgery. It gets way down deep into the muscle and the nerves and often has a high rate of recurrence. It's a real problem for the patients that get it. And they can look very, very similar, nearly identical in some cases. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a Mac in a minute to help you see the differences. But the problem that I face is that on a small partial biopsy, which is what often happens, you often get a shave where it just shows part of it. So I see some of this and I think, well, this could be MAC or desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So I usually, on a partial biopsy, I usually tell my dermatologist, please go back and do a conservative excision of the entire lesion so I can see the bottom. Because the base of the lesion is what helps you the most, I think, in telling whether it's a MAC or a desmoplastic trichoep, okay? 
So here, the tumor, it kind of pushes towards the edge of the subcutis, but does not infiltrate extensively down. Most of the time, microcystic and nexal carcinoma will infiltrate deeply into the subcutis and even the deeper muscle. And um, I have seen rare exceptions of that that were more like plaque-like and spread out. Um, but, uh, but most of the time, they infiltrate deeply. So when you see a tumor that is confined to the dermis and relatively circumscribed, when you can see the excision, you can see the edge of the tumor, actually you can kind of draw a line around it. Even though each individual island doesn't look circumscribed at all, the whole thing actually has kind of its own stroma and you can kind of draw an outline, like the tumor stops, look, the tumor stops here, see? It doesn't like go trickling out way away from itself. Um, there is another thing that we look for is the presence of sweat ducts. In microcystic adnexal carcinoma, you should have sweat duct differentiation. The problem is, is that the sweat ducts are often very compressed and it's hard to see them, particularly at the surface of the lesion. I feel like most of the time in MAC, you, looking deeper down is where you start to see obvious sweat ducts. So here I don't see any duct formation. And then the other thing to be careful of is that there are normal sweat ducts in the dermis, remember, eccrine ducts. So you're gonna find like right here, there's a duct, right? But it's just a background sweat duct that's in the middle of here, okay? So if you start seeing more ducts than you should for that given area of dermis, that's when you can start getting worried. These keratin-filled cysts are very characteristic, both of desmoplastic trichoepithelioma and also of microcystic adnexal carcinoma. So that's why it's a really challenging differential to sort out. Um, I wanted to bring this up because A, it's difficult and treacherous and, and a lot rides on it. And B, I want to point out that even though we call this a trichoepithelioma, this doesn't look anything like the regular trichoepithelioma I just showed you. Look, let's go back to it. Here's tri conventional trichoepithelioma. And then here's desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So even though they're called under the same name, in my, in my thought, they are really two different tumors. Yeah, they're both benign hair follicle tumors, but they look totally different. Um, so I think that's an important thing to, to remember that this isn't just like a slightly different variant of regular trico -ep. You just have to think of it as a totally separate tumor that, um, you know, your main differential here is ruling out microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Okay, here's another look, another sweat duct that I think just represents a background entrapped duct. You can use some different stains that people have talked about, um, looking for um, using like CEA to try to highlight duct lumens. Um, I will also sometimes use CK20 here to highlight scattered Merkel cells that are present usually in desmoplastic trico -ep, but not usually in MAC. Um, but again, I feel like in the end, I can do all those stains, but I'm still going to usually say, well, just go do a small excision so I can see the base of the lesion in, in any event. And in the past, I would often say that nerve involvement was a really strong indication of microcystic adnexal carcinoma. But then... Uh, the group from uh, Yale published a paper showing that actually a majority of desmoplastic trichoepitheliomas have involvement and in wrapping of small nerves in the dermis by tumor cells. And at first I thought there's no way that's true, but then I actually read the paper and it was very convincing and all of the patients went on to have good follow-up. And I actually recently, well, it was a little while ago, a year or so ago, had a case like that. And after reading the paper, I was convinced enough that I I told the surgeon, I think even though the margins are positive, I actually feel like I can see the base of the lesion. I feel like it's okay to just watch and wait. And it spared this young woman having to have a bigger surgery on her face. So here's an example that we happen to find right here. This is a tiny little dermal nerve and it's totally wrapped by an island of basaloid cells. So this is an area where I totally changed my viewpoint and the way I practice pathology based on a paper. And I thought, what a kudos to those, uh, to those authors, right? When you write a paper good enough that it changes the way people practice, that's the kind of papers we should be writing and publishing uh, in the literature. Okay, so, but here's a case though where I'm glad that I had the excision to remove the entire thing so we can actually see the whole lesion. Okay, now in contrast, and I'll just tell you what the diagnosis is here, this is microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Don't look too exciting at first, so you get down closer. Sweat ducts and more and more and more and more, they're everywhere. And yes, this is just background eccrine coils, normal eccrine sweat glands. Oh, the reference is, um, I'll actually send you the link. Google's wonderful. There you go. Oh wait, that went privately. Why not to the everyone? 
So here's the paper that I'm referencing by um, Dr. Yedrich and LaFell and McNiff. And really, it's a very beautifully done paper. Not only is it nice because it's really interesting cases and it's a very well laid out argument, it actually goes into discussing about why things, why perineural invasion happens in carcinomas and what other things can grow around nerves. Uh, it's really, really actually very cool from like kind of a, a basic skin biology perspective and it's a beautifully written paper. So I, I, it was one that stands out in my mind as a paper I read and I was incredibly um, uh, impressed by. So bravo to those authors. And uh, also I know Dr. McNiff uh, from a long time for working with her at ASDP and she's just really a fantastic person too. All right, so, so here we can see that we've got those little basaloid elongated tadpole-like islands, but we've got lots and lots and lots of sweat ducts. Notice something, this is a carcinoma, but how much atypia do you see there? None, these are bland tumors. If you see an infiltrative tumor that looks ugly and you think might be MAC, it's not MAC, almost certainly not, okay? I'm sure there's exceptions, but that if I see ugly infiltrating cords, I think about, is this a, an infiltrative squamous cell carcinoma? Or is this a metastatic adenocarcinoma from somewhere else in the body, okay? So I wasn't gonna go into metastases here, but if you were debating between a metastasis versus say microcystic adnexal carcinoma, and you could only do one immunostain to help sort those out, what would you do to sort out a, a skin adnexal tumor from a metastatic adenocarcinoma? Any takers, you can type it into the chat box. This is one of these little things of a, uh, that I actually find very helpful in real practice and, and I use it a lot. No one, no one's taking it. EMA, good idea. So keratin is going to stain this, but it's also going to stain metastatic carcinoma. Mucy carmine will stain anything that makes mucin, which this tumor is not making um, epithelial mucins. This is not making epithelial mucin, so that could help if you have a, an adenocarcinoma that's making epithelial mucin. CK7 can stain a lot of different sweat gland tumors and so can EMA. EMA can also stain squamous cell carcinomas um, for that matter. CEA will highlight these ducts, that's true, but it will highlight a lot of different um, uh, adenocarcinoma ducts. So the answer in my book is P63 or P40, which both work, work equivalently in my experience, that those are the vast majority of skin adnexal tumors, both benign and malignant, with a few exceptions like mucinous carcinoma and some apocrine carcinomas in the skin will be P63 negative, but most other adnexal tumors, benign ones and malignant ones, as well as basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma and seborrheic keratosis, all of the epidermal derived tumors, all of those tumors are gonna have strong diffuse P63 and P40 expression in their nuclei, whereas adenocarcinomas from visceral organs are usually negative for those markers, uh, one exception is that a small subset of lung adenocarcinomas can express P63, which is why P40 basically became popular to help uh, lung pathologists sort out adeno versus squame. So I found that P the published data talks mostly about P63 as supportive of uh, skin adnexal tumors versus metastatic adeno, but I found that P40 works similarly. And it's a really crisp stain, it's really strong, it's not wishy-washy, so I use that all the time when I'm trying to help rule out a metastatic adeno. If it ends up being P40 positive and it's in the skin, it's probably not an adenocarcinoma from inside the, the visceral uh, component, okay? from the, the uh, internal organs. Um, now that doesn't work with squamous cell carcinoma, of course. Squamous cell carcinoma from any site is gonna be P63 and P40 negative, I'm mean, sorry, P63 and P40 positive, regardless of whether it's from the lung or the cervix or the skin or the oropharyngeal area. Okay, so the thing is, is that MAC has these ducts, but oftentimes the ducts are not visible until you go way down. In this case, they're more obvious, but the ducts, what, one thing that can help you with ducts is seeing little pink secretion inside them. For any sort of sweat duct um, differentiation in a tumor, sometimes it's hard to tell, is that just a white space or is it actually a duct? If you find pink secretion inside of it, that supports the idea that it's probably a real duct. Here's a more example, see? That's inspissated or dried up sweat secretion that's clogging up these little ducts. But look, as we go down, it just keeps going and keeps going and now we're down in the muscle and it's still there, and it's in the fat and the muscle, and it also is gonna usually involve nerves. You, perineural invasion is very common in this tumor, but like I said, small dermal nerves are often involved in the setting of desmoplastic trichoep, so 
just seeing it or a tumor around nerves in the dermis is not enough to make something into a MAC. Uh, here's an example. Here's a nerve, a big nerve with intraneural. It looks like normal sweat ducts, but they're in the middle of a big, deep nerve. So this is microcystic adnexal uh, carcinoma. And this is actually, I think, probably the best, most classic example that I've ever seen. Um, and I will point out, let's see if they have them in this case. Usually these tumors do have little keratin filled cysts superficially. So again, it makes them look quite a bit like, no, this one actually doesn't, but usually, usually they have those little keratin cysts just like desmoplastic trichoepitheliomatous. Um, okay, so that's an example of uh, MAC, microcystic adnexal carcinoma. I love this particular case, it's so pretty. There's a bunch of little basaloid islands here, all kind of intermingled together. But I think this is another time we're looking at low power is helpful. If we go straight to high power, you'll say, oh, wow, maybe these are infiltrative islands of basaloid cells. But if you back up to low power, you can tell that this is actually a very nicely circumscribed tumor. You can see exactly where the tumor stops and where it interfaces with the adjacent dermis, right? And the reason it does this is, look, it does have all these basaloid islands, but they're all encased and invested in their own unique stroma. See how the stroma here that's hugging and wrapping around each of the tumor islands looks totally different from the background dermis, which kind of has a lot of edema in this particular case. So I find that really helpful. A lot of skin, a lot of hair follicle tumors tend to have not only have their own stroma, but their stroma really wraps and encases the whole tumor and kind of is separate and distinct from the surrounding uh, dermis. I find that very, very useful. The islands here are very basaloid and they've got, look at the perfect peripheral palisading, just like a basal cell, right? But they have the stroma hugs. See how it's like getting more cellular right next to the nest and more cellular right around the nest. So even though this is not well-formed papillary mesenchymal bodies, this, this wrapping and hugging of the nest by the cellular stroma is very characteristic and helpful clue to support a hair follicle tumor rather than a basal cell carcinoma. So the stroma here is not as pink, actually does have a tiny touch of a myxoid or mucinous quality, but the cellularity wrapping the islands, very helpful. So peripheral palisading is gonna be seen in both basal cell carcinoma and trichoepithelioma slash trichoblastoma. Um, someone mentioned earlier BER EP4, BRRP4. BRRP4 expression is going to be seen in trichoep, trichoblastoma, and basal cell carcinoma. So not going to help you really uh, sort those out. They're going to stain all of those tumors in most cases. So this is one of those things where really the, the thing that helps me here more than anything else is the H&E appearance. And it's really not so much the islands themselves, it's what the stroma is doing around the islands and how it's interfacing with the islands. Because the individual island here, if you put this in the, in the middle of a solar elastosis in the dermis and put some mucin around it, I'd call it basal cell carcinoma. But here with the stroma around it, there's no way this is, there's no way a basal cell carcinoma is gonna grow like this. A nodule, big nodule that's perfectly circumscribed, that's just not how basal cell grows, right? It just doesn't do that. So um, this is a nice example, I think, of a trichoblastoma because it's big and deep. And again, that's just the way that I was trained is if they're larger and deeper, you can call them trichoblastoma. If they're small and superficial, you can call them trichoepithelioma. Or if you can't decide, flip a coin and just pick one. Or you can say trichoepithelioma slash trichoblastoma. It's your report, who's gonna, who's gonna give you trouble over that? Your surgeons might not like it, but you know, it's okay. Sometimes I've done that with certain things where there's like overlap and I said, or you can say benign, benign hair follicle tumor. I've done that occasionally, although that sounds a little more wishy-washy. And one of my attendings said, um, said you know, that when, when it doesn't matter at all for patient care, be totally definitive about the diagnosis. Don't say, well, this is a benign keratosis that has overlapping features of Veruca and seborrheic keratosis. No, say this is seborrheic keratosis. It's the best one I've ever seen. And that way you can save your hedging for times like, oh, this could be Spitz nevus or it could be melanoma, I'm not sure. Because if you hedge all the time, then your dermatologist, and I know there are derms in the audience and they can attest to this, they're gonna be like that Jared Gardner guy, he's always hedging about everything. And they won't actually know when I'm like, no, no, seriously though, this time guys, I'm really worried. This could be something bad. So um, I, try to, I try to be as definitive as I can when possible, but when I'm really not sure and it matters for patient care, I'm gonna be the first person to tell my, my derms and my surgeons, this is a hard case and I'm not really sure and I'm happy to do whatever you want. I can send it for another opinion. I can send it for two extra opinions. I just want everyone to sleep well at night and get right good care for the patient. 
And I think that helps me sleep well at night. And I want my, my treating physicians to know that they never need to be afraid to call me up and say, hey, um, would you mind uh, sending this out for a second opinion? It's not that we don't trust you. I feel like when they call me and ask that, they're always like, you know, the patient just kind of worried. And I'm like, look, man, I'm not, I'm not offended. I know you guys trust me. Um, I'm, not, I'm not ever offended when a patient or a surgical or, or a treating physician colleague wants an extra opinion because that's like the cheapest way to make everyone sleep at night for, for well, I know, sorry, I know in Canada, the money aspect probably is not really like it is in the US, but here it costs a, a, maybe a couple hundred dollars to get a second opinion. And when, that's, when, when someone's gonna get a major surgery, that couple hundred dollars to reassure everyone is to me priceless. And the day that my ego gets in the way of me doing good patient care, then I got no business being in this hospital or sitting at this microscope. That's the way I wanna practice medicine at least. So there, sorry, more, more philosophy than you asked for today, but I'm feeling particularly, particularly philosophical in these, these dark days of coronavirus. Okay, so normally I can hear my audience laugh at my bad jokes and I can't hear you guys. So it's, I like that Van um, typed ha ha uh, in the chat box. Thank you, that gives me the strength to keep going. And I can see Greta laughing visibly, so I appreciate that also. Thank you, respect. Okay, so anyway, trichoblastomas can have a whole wide range of, um, of features. Sometimes they got little tiny nests like this. Sometimes they're big, huge cellular nests or sheets. Sometimes they have this kind of staghorn branchy pattern. There's a wide, wide range. And in fact, hair follicle tumors as a group have an enormous spectrum of variation that, that they can produce because think of all the different parts of the hair follicle. When there's a hair follicle tumor, each of those parts can be represented and in different amounts and in different configurations. So of all the skin and nexal tumors, you definitely, I think, have the most variety from the hair follicle neoplasms. And I love what uh, Ron Rapini, one of my heroes and my mentors from training, uh, he's a dermatopathologist at University of Texas, Houston, and he's hilarious and a great teacher. And he's got a really great book that's funny. But in his book, he said that hair, uh, hair follicle tumors are like snowflakes. And this was back before snowflake was like a, an insult to throw at someone on the internet. This was back when we said, oh, snowflakes are little crystals and each one is different and no, no two are exactly alike. And I think it's a perfectly apt description that hair follicle tumors, I will never see another trichoblastoma that looks exactly like this one right here. They will, uh, will always look a little different each time. I feel like there are some tumors that really look the same each time. Hair follicle tumors are not one of them. They look, each one looks a little different from the next. And so that makes them challenging, right? Because you have to learn the, the broad strokes of patterns rather than this exact image recognition, which I think is a lot harder. So in any case, here we have trichoblastoma. These are benign. Um, and they can be pretty large and they actually can occur in older people, um, particularly on the scalp or the head and neck. So they can be a big nodule like this. Okay. Is a kind of interesting case. Does anyone know what it is from this power? I like that benignoma. Uh, Van said that we should call stuff benignomas. Sounds fair. Okay, I see pilomatricoma. I see fibrofolliculoma. I see pilomatrixoma. Same thing as pilomatricoma. I actually prefer the spelling with the X for the sake of how it looks, because the X is kind of exotic and cool, but it's actually easier to pronounce pilomatricoma. It flows off the tongue a little easier uh, to me. So I usually actually say pilomatricoma, but I have to say that there's deep love for the X. Or if you want to get old school, yeah, you can call this a calcifying epithelioma of malherb, if you like eponyms, if you're into that sort of thing. So what, um, what helps us tell that this is probably a pilomatricoma um, from low power? Pilometricomas have several components that can be present in varying amounts. One is sheets of blue basaloid cells, okay? That's what we're seeing right here, these blue basaloid cells. The other thing they have are these sheets of dead cells that are keratinized, and they're ghost cells or shadow cells, right? You can actually see where the nuclei used to be from each of these cells. They look like a sheet of keratinocytes that have died suddenly and left behind their, their cytokeratin skeletons. So you can see the outline of each individual cell where it borders with its neighbor. You can see where the nucleus used to be that's totally ghosted out and washed out. And then usually there's kind of these little intermediate cells right here in between where you can see the blue cells transitioning and getting more pink and then their nuclei kind of getting pycnotic and dying away and then it transitions into the ghost cells. So that's the components of pilometricoma. And then in addition to that, almost always, 
you're going to have extensive exuberant reactive infiltrate granulomas giant cells keratin filled giant cells and granulomas um, reactive fibroblasts and myofibroblasts a whole bunch of different inflammatory cells all over the place and so all of that really brisk infiltrate can get quite busy and until you're used to this you can sometimes get real scared by seeing this because some of the giant cells can look kind of weird sometimes and guess what you're going to find mitoses in reactive histiocytes and myofibroblasts so that stuff can i think sometimes scare people also because basically the way i think of these is that they grow kind of like a cyst but then they rupture and break apart i don't know if that's actually what happens physiologically or uh, biologically in the tumor's development, but they always have this kind of look like they're a cystic structure that's just been burst open and then the whole dermis has reacted against it. Because you know, keratin is a normal, a normal protein made by our body and our body loves keratin as long as it stays the heck in the epithelium where it belongs. As soon as that keratin breaks out of the epithelium and gets down below the basement membrane, the immune system goes berserk and just freaks out and hates it and, and, and makes all this reaction to it. That's why you know, ruptured cysts and hair follicles get this really brisk reactive immune response and scarring and all these things that, that are caused. So it's kind of a strange thing to me that, that keratin, this totally innocuous substance that's so, so essential for, for life basically, really just pisses off the dermis. The dermis and the immune system just can't handle it. You just hate the keratin. All right, so in any case, the, to make a diagnosis of pilometricoma and, um, I see this, oh, uh, implications of multiple pilometricomas. I will come to that in a second. To make a diagnosis, if I see a fragment of ghost cells with some reaction around it, I'm comfortable saying that's pilometricoma. Um, and sometimes on a biopsy, that's all you'll get. You'll get a shave and you'll just get a little nip of that ghost cell. Or if you want, you can say, I, I think it's suggestive of, but it may not be representative of the whole, the whole, um, the whole spectrum of, uh, or the whole lesion, okay? So that's fine. Um, the... Uh, the, but I think that that's pretty helpful to find these ghost cells and recognize that because sometimes it's just little fragments that you might get on a biopsy. The other thing that I'll point out is that a lot of times pilometricomas are totally burned out and all you have are these sheets of ghost cells and the reactive change and you don't have any of the blue basaloid cells. So because of that, I think that sometimes when people first see one like this, that's got nice big sheets of basaloid cells, they get a little freaked out because they're like, ooh, can you have all that? And then once you start looking closer, this is why you don't start at high power, okay? Because if you go to this on high power and you see sheets of round blue cells with one, two, three, three mitoses per high power field, 30 per 10 high power fields, you're gonna call this something malignant. You say malignant round blue cell tumor, right? So the context is everything, okay? The, you know, this, I always worry like on cytology, I've never seen a case yet, but all I can imagine is someone puts a needle into this and just gets this area, and boy, you go down the tubes real fast. So the, in the context of what everything looks like here, we know that this is totally fine. Mitotic activity is usually present in the basaloid cells and is usually florid, tons of it, tons and tons. And I get cases on a regular basis, people send me and say, well, we're really worried. Is this too much mitotic activity? And the answer is always no, it's okay. If I see a typical mitosis or I see really wildly pleomorphic cells, that is more concerning for the possibility of a malignant pilometricoma or pilometrical carcinoma, matrical carcinoma, whatever name you like. <clears throat> Those are quite rare, but they do happen. And I will say as a, as a, it's not a perfect rule, but as a general tip, if I see something and right away think this looks like pilometricoma, almost always it ends up just being pilometricoma, regardless of mites or anything else. When I've seen pilometrical carcinomas or matrical carcinoma, whatever name you like, those cases usually I look at and I say, ooh, this looks like an ugly carcinoma. And then I start seeing areas of this transition to ghost cell focally or of some trichohyaline granules, those little red blobs, those little red granules you see in the inner root sheath of a normal hair follicle. You can see those sometimes in matrical carcinomas. You can also see them in normal basal cell carcinoma too occasionally. So usually I start at cancer and then after the fact, I realize, oh, there's some matrical component here. We should call this a matrical carcinoma. That's usually how I diagnose malignant pilometricoma or pilometrical carcinoma. Whereas when I look and I say, oh, this looks like an obvious pilometricoma, almost always those end up being benign. Although I'll tell you an exception that I had um, uh, sometime in the past year or so was a patient that had an example of a, of a pre-existing nodule that, uh, 
that looked like a pilometricoma. And then rapidly, it grew to like 10 centimeters in size and um, they excised it and within like months and it was infiltrating way down into the fat. So even though the actual cells looked just like pilometricoma, which was terrifying because on a, on a partial biopsy without that history, I would have said pilometricoma, we're done. But that case, I said, I think the only way to interpret this is that this must be a, a, a pilometricoma that probably was pre-existing and then turned malignant and had explosive uh, growth. Okay, so usually pilometricomas are, are thought of as pediatric tumors, but I've seen them in patients of all ages. In fact, the last one I diagnosed, I think was like in a 75 or 80 year old, um, like a month ago, I saw one or a few weeks ago. So it can totally happen um, in any age and they can be quite big. I saw one um, on the elbow of, um, I don't know, maybe a 60 something year old that was like six centimeters, violaceous nodule, came into our orthopedic oncologist. They thought it was gonna be a sarcoma. Re resected it, looked perfect for pilometricoma, perfectly circumscribed, no atypical mites, no pleomorphism, and years later, no problems, no recurrences. So um, this is a good tumor to know about because there are things about it that can really scare you that you need to learn to be comfortable with. It kind of breaks the rules of what we accept in most, in most tumors. All right. And you know, remember, the reason these have mites is because these are recapitulating the germinative cells of the hair bulb of a growing hair follicle. If you go look at the blue basaloid cells in the root of a big deep hair follicle, they're going to look just like this, and they're going to have mitoses because that's what they're doing. They're growing. They're dividing. Okay. Are you guys still good? You, you, I have as long as I want, basically, right? Okay, cool. This is great. Usually, people like cut me off and open a trap door under the stage um, most of the time, but that's this is great. And Greta, just so you know, your face is the top of the list. So you are representing all of Canadian dermatology and pathology right now. How you respond is how I'm assuming everyone's responding. So, all right, just no pressure. All right. Ah, uh, yes, I love these. So fun. So we can tell we got a, a papule, kind of a sessile papule. And again, you, the dermatologist doesn't have to tell me. I can tell this has got to be a papule. Look, there's where the normal skin is. Here's where the normal skin. And we've got a little collarette, the skin kind of wrapping under the edge. And then this nodule's bulged up from the skin surface. I can tell that clinically it must have been scaly and crusty because it's got parakeratosis and serum crust on the surface. And someone, Philippe Lefrancois, I apologize, my French pronunciation is just terrible. Je parle en peu français. And after I say that, you're like, yeah, clearly, very little. So um, in any case, um, yeah, right away, you nailed it. Trichelomoma or trichelomoma, whichever name you like. And by the way, I did a, a video interview of Ron Rapini for the American Society of Dermatopathology. If you go to their YouTube channel, there's a whole bunch of uh, video interviews. And I've done a lot of them, and so I'm a little biased, but, but it's not, they're not great because of me. They're great because we're interviewing all these amazing legends in the field of dermatopathology, and it's really awesome to get to sit there and hear their stories. So I feel very honored to get to be the interviewer, but I particularly selected that I wanted to be the one to interview Dr. Rapini because he's so funny, and he said so many funny things during sign out when I was a resident, and I tried to like kind of uh, you know, get him to say those things again. And so I asked him at the end of the video what his favorite tumor uh, I said, what's your favorite skin tumor? And he's like, oh, I, I don't know. I, he's like, I guess tricky lamoma because he said, I used to dictate it. And back before they had like, you know, they, back when they had dictations on cassette tapes in the olden days, he's like, and then he'd give it to his transcriptionist who was in the next room. And every time he said tricky lamoma, she would always laugh because it was like a tricky tumor. And so I was like, that's just solid, solid gold for Derm Path Comedy. Okay. So yeah, this is a tricky lamoma. And trichelomomas tend to have this kind of bulging, pushing down shape or a bowl shape that pushing into the, the um, dermis. Um, and uh, at, in the bottom, that's what they look like. At the top, they tend to be warty oftentimes. And in fact, some people believe that these are really variants of, um, of uh, wart. And some people believe that these are actually just warts that involve a hair follicle. And there's been arguments back and forth and people testing for HPV and some studies say yes and some say no. I think that they're actually hair follicle tumors, but they certainly do look warty on the surface in many cases. This one doesn't particularly, probably because the patient scratched and ulcerated it away, but clinically oftentimes they're on the nose or elsewhere on the face most of the time. And they often clinically think it's either wart versus basal cell carcinoma. So that's the, the clinical impression from the dermatologist is often includes wart in their differential because they have a verrucous looking surface in many cases, okay? So um, the, uh, the key is that you've got this, this bulging shape pushing down to the dermis. 
the cells are kind of basaloid, like a basal cell carcinoma a little bit, but they have clear cell change. This one's beautiful. And, and this is one of these times where we say clear cell, but what we mean is light pale gray, right? Or, or, or something like that. They're not like totally clear, like a cebocyte clear, but we have these pale um, epithelial cells, pale kind of basaloid cells. And the amount of pale clear can vary quite a bit from case to case. I would say this case is like picture perfect, better than what we usually see in practice. Much of the time, it looks kind of like this, basaloid with just a little area of kind of pale clear cytoplasm. There's gonna be peripheral palisading of the nuclei right around the base, but unlike basal cell carcinoma, usually it's gonna lack that mucin filled cleft. Although I've seen a couple times where there were exceptions, most of the time you don't have that mucin filled cleft, okay? So recognizing this pattern right here and that smooth border is really, really helpful because sometimes trichelomomas do something weird in the middle. They do this. And if you just took a picture of this, I could put it in any book and say this is a basal infiltrative basal cell carcinoma with kind of squamatization or basosquamous carcinoma or infiltrative squam if you wanted, any variation of infiltrative bad skin cancer, right? Look at the, these, these little cords of cells just going everywhere and invading the dermis with all this mucinous looking response. You give anyone a biopsy just of this and they're gonna say, yeah, that's infiltrative carcinoma, basal squam or some combo, whatever name you wanna give it, patient needs Mohs surgery, you know, this has got to be, it's going to be aggressive clinically. This is one of those where looking in the middle is going to mess you up. Looking at the edge, we can tell, no, this is not infiltrative at all. This got this beautiful smooth border that's not infiltrative in any way. All the stuff that looks infiltrative is pseudo infiltrative in the middle of the lesion. It's just all tangled up. You can actually see the same phenomenon in nodular basal cell carcinomas, actually. Basal cell carcinomas that in the middle look very infiltrative and more feoform looking, but out at the periphery clearly have smooth borders and are not invading far away from the main tumor mass. So this concept of having this busy area in the middle of a tumor is very characteristic of, of this version of trichelomoma, which we call desmoplastic trichelomoma. It's a trichelomoma with this desmoplastic change in the middle. And you can see this phenomenon in other types of tumors, basal cell carcinoma and other adnexal tumors that look busy in the middle, but are smooth at the edges, okay? So the important thing is this is a benign entity, okay? And this is kind of confusing because if we go back to trichoepithelioma, and a lot of times trainees get these confused because all these freaking trico names, right? This is why people don't like Dermpath because we've got a hundred names and they all sound alike for everything. Okay, trichoepithelioma and desmoplastic trichoepithelioma look totally different. And, and, and I, in my thinking, I feel like they are two different tumors probably. They're both benign hair follicle tumors, but they look and seem totally different. Here, on the other hand, what we call desmoplastic trichelomoma, I think is just a regular trichelomoma that has this variation pattern in the middle. They just got a, this funny change to it. Um, and the reason that these are important is they're A, trichelomomas are relatively common. They're often on the face and get diagnosed because the clinician is worried that it may be a basal cell carcinoma. And then on a partial biopsy of one of these desmoplastic ones, you're gonna easily call this cancer when it's actually benign. So if you just had a biopsy through here, there's really nothing that you could legitimately do. I would probably call this cancer and so would anyone. And you know, the patient would get over treatment, but in the end, the outcome would be fine. So you can only do so much, but the thing is to always remember that if you say you had a shave biopsy that showed this, it's always a good game to play, I think. It's kind of a scary game, but I like to play this when I've got a big specimen is the, what would I have called this if I only had a biopsy here or here? Try to imagine, would I have been able to make this diagnosis without seeing the entire specimen? It, again, it's scary because you'll realize, oh my gosh, how many things am I misdiagnosing? And, and but it helps, teach you when to be cautious, right? And in, in dermatopathology, we spend a lot of time, at least in the United States, looking at shave biopsies, which in fact, I'm actually okay with. I, I think shave biopsies done by a skilled dermatologist are actually really an appropriate way to handle a lot of different things, but there are some limitations to them. And the partial sampling of bigger lesions is certainly one of the main limitations that we see. So in this case though, if you had a shave here, this area looks very scary, but over here we see basaloid, palisading and clear cell change. So what I would do if I had this is I would say, this is actually suggestive of a desmoplastic 
trichelomoma. However, I can't really see the whole lesion and it goes to the base. So if, it, if they're concerned that it may not be representative or if the lesion persists or grows back, then they may need to remove it to make sure that there's not something more, more aggressive underneath. So that's kind of how I'll handle this case um, if I see some areas like this. So learning to recognize that background trichelomoma um, is a useful clue that can help you out in difficult uh, cases, okay? So the other thing is, is I've gone back and forth in, you know, it's fun to recognize this pattern and to, to use it for teaching. But in my path report, sometimes I just call this trichelomoma. If I got the whole thing and I'm totally sure it's a benign trichelomoma, I, you know, if it was just this and I had to hedge and say I'm not sure, then I'll bring up it could be desmoplastic trichelomoma. But if the whole lesion's there and I'm, it's obviously this is benign, then sometimes just calling it trichelomoma is fine because the dermatologist knows that's benign. Desmoplastic is a scary word, right? Because desmoplastic melanoma and other things that have that term in it. And so I feel like sometimes that causes um, unnecessary anxiety. And in fact, not long ago, I actually broke my rule and I said, I'm going to call it desmoplastic trichelomoma because it's such a beautiful one. And, and I just feel, you know, like adding an extra adjective today. And sure enough, actually, the, the dermatologist said, they emailed me and said, you know, uh, these are benign. And so I'm okay. I mean, they knew it was benign, but they still wanted to double check with me that it was okay to just follow the patient. I said, oh, yeah, totally fine. But I realized it, it causes people to have a little extra anxiety sometimes, I think. Um, I'm, the dermatologists who are watching this are welcome to comment on that. You know, does it freak you out to hear desmoplastic or are you like, no, no problem. It's all good. Um, you can add your comments in the chat box. All right. So, but really good example though, that they can get very, very scary looking in the middle. Freaks us out. See, I knew it. I knew it. So, which is also why I don't call things desmoplastic nevus. Yes, it's been described. I call them sclerotic nevus if I want to use, because sclerotic is not a scary word. There are certain words that have become kind of trigger words, right? Spitz or spitzoid, scary sounding word because of all the angst over spitzoid lesions. And there are other words like that. And, and in the end, you know, okay, another philosophy point, because why not? You guys have been so tolerant of everything I'm saying. And there's probably only two people left on the call, but that's okay. The, um, in any case, the, um, oh yeah, my point was, is, I, you know, pathologists, we love to be semantically pure, you know? We love to be super precise and detailed with our language. But there are times when I would, I'm never going to like lie and say something is something that it's not. But there are times where I would rather use a somewhat less precise term or a term that doesn't technically fit perfectly with, you know, the, the, our scientific knowledge of this thing, if that term actually gets the message across in a better way that will enable good patient care. So I, I think that that's, um, I think that's an important, uh, important thing for me um, that I, I try to always think, am I actually clearly communicating the message that's going to get the patient the right treatment? Again, just to be clear, I'm not telling you to lie and make up diagnoses or to say something, something that it's not. But there are times where we argue about terms and say, well, technically this should be called this. And that's fine in the literature, but this is part of what makes um, pathology in general confusing, especially to non-pathologists, because we're constantly changing the names of everything. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's true, okay? You know, that, that there are times where our renaming of things to be technically accurate um, causes problems. And I love that someone just said that Sarah Jean Pilon said, know your clinicians. It's totally true. That's, we could do philosophy all day, but spending time to develop a good relationship with all of the people who send you biopsies and all of your surgeons and dermatologists, getting to know them, getting, give them your cell phone number. Don't just call them when there's a problem, right? Build a relationship with them, call them and ask them for clinical info or say, this is a hard case and I'm debating how to handle this. What are you going to do with the patient? Or like, you know, how much rides on this? That can A, let you sleep a lot better. And also I think it makes your dermatology and surgery colleagues feel more comfortable calling you because sometimes they may have a little doubt, but they're like, well, I don't really want to bother them. But if they're already friends with me, then they'll just be like, hey, just, you know, is this cool? Like, do I need to worry about this? And I want to know when they have doubts. I would rather know if something doesn't make sense, I would rather know tomorrow or next week rather than next year when it's metastasized or there's some terrible problem. And they were like, well, I felt it was kind of weird at the time, but you said it was benign. I would rather know now, again, then only my ego suffers and the patient doesn't get hurt. So build that trust, build that rapport. That you don't want the first time that you call your dermatology colleagues to be when the lab's lost a specimen or it dissolved during processing. That's, that's not a great fun way to start a relationship. And those things will happen no matter how good your lab is. It happens to everybody in every lab. There's going to be problems. And it's better to have that friendship and that rapport built up ahead of time. And, um, and in any case, there you go. That's, that's my little bit of wisdom that I've learned is in the end, the relationships with people, they matter more than all the technology in the world.
Okay. okay. We beat that one to death. But, um, but I like trachealomomas, so. Uh, what is this little beauty? Well, okay, let me see if I can turn it around. Hmm. There's like no right way. There, that's, that's close enough. Anyone want to take a stab at this? I'll show you another area and then I'll go into higher power. And I always tell my residents if they, if they guess the diagnosis from low power and get it wrong, it's okay. I'll give them half a point for boldness and then I'll give them a higher power view. So, so bold but wrong still gets you something. Not in the real world, but in the teaching world it works, okay? Low power, higher mind. There you go. That's right. Recognize the low power is correct. And Philippe, you got it right. Is it, this is a beautiful trico folliculoma, but trichoadenoma is a totally legit and understandable answer. And this is, goes back to what I said that all of these follicular tumors have a lot of overlap, okay? The key here to me is that you've got a central cystic space, okay? Classically, this space communicates up and connects to the epidermis. But you gotta remember that when you have cystic, a, a, a lesion that's like kind of a crater that goes up to the epidermis, and then comes down and becomes a cyst. If you cut straight through the middle of it when you're sectioning, you know, grossing, and you gross it right in the middle, and you get a perfect histology section right through it, then you're gonna see this opening out to the surface and you can tell it's a big dilated hair follicle with little buds of hair follicles coming off of it. And you'll say, ah, trico folliculoma. And that's what the books always show because that's what the classic example is. But the problem is that in real life, there's three dimensional things. And a lot of times if you don't cut right down the middle and you cut a little bit to the side, what you're gonna see is a cyst in the dermis and you won't see that connection. This is true of any sort of invaginated cystic lesion, a trichofolliculomas, keratoacanthomas, or keratoacanthoma variant of squamous cell carcinoma, whichever name you like. I've got a YouTube video on that and you can watch it and debate with me in the comments if you like, if you're into that sort of thing. Molluscum contagiosum is a great example. If you get right through the umbilication, it looks that perfect little cup, but there's also plenty of times that you'll see it and it looks like a cyst in the dermis. So that's a good general truth that, that just because it looks like a cyst, most of the cysts that we see, like even regular um, epithelial inclusion cysts or follicular and fundibular cysts, whatever name you like, epidermoid cysts, they connect up to the surface. They have a little punctum that drains um, uh, you know, the smelly keratin debris out of it clinically. So uh, it's just a matter of whether you get a cut that shows that. Okay. And um, yeah, so in the middle, we've got basically a dilated hair follicle. And just like the infundibular a portion of a hair follicle or the follicular infundibular cyst, which some people call EIC or epidermoid cyst, the lining basically here looks more or less like epidermis. We get stratified squamous epithelium. Usually there'll be a little bit of a granular layer, sometimes not depending. Um, and then kind of loose flaky keratin in the inside. You may have some hair shafts in here too. The key is what's happening outside of that cyst. And what you have here are basically little basaloid islands that are little immature, irregular, malformed hair follicles, little baby hair follicles. And here's a perfect example, look at that. We got the little hair root with the germinative epithelium and you can see it starting the transition to make, almost wants to make a little hair shaft and it's making an inner root sheath. The inner root sheath is that portion that has these little, these little uh, bright orangey red globules that we call trichohyalin granules, right? With the purple granules on the surface of the skin are keratohyaline granules. These reddish orange granules uh, that are bright and fiery down in the hair follicle we call trichohyaline granules. So you can see them in normal hair follicles and also in tumors with um, inner root sheath differentiation. And then here's outer root sheath differentiation, the stuff that looks like those glycogenated clear cells, like the little piano keys when they're well organized. So this is basically like a little baby hair hair uh, follicle that's trying to form and is growing into the center of the cyst. So basically the idea is that this is a mother follicle and there's all these little tiny baby follicles around it. Or uh, Dr. Rapini, I think like to say the hen and chicks, this is like the mama hen and all of her little baby chicks uh, surrounding her. Um, the, uh, the point that um, someone made about trichoadenoma is really good. A lot of times you get cystic spaces here. These little side follicles make little cysts. And so if you gave me a cut just of of this, you're seeing all of these little tiny cysts close together, and that's what trichoadenoma is supposed to look like. In my experience, trichoadenoma is quite rare because most of the time when I see stuff that looks kind of like trichoadenoma, 
other parts of the tumor actually have some basaloid stuff that looks more like trichoepithelioma or a big cystic space that looks more like trichofolliculoma. So to find a trichoadenoma that just has all of these little cysts together, I feel like it's pretty rare. I only have a few of them in my whole, you know, multi-thousand slide uh, study sets. But again, this just highlights how much overlap there is between all of these different hair follicle uh, tumors. I mean, I think Bernie Ackerman wrote like a huge thick book just on hair follicle tumors. So, you know, if you've got a lot of, and you got a lot of spare time on your hands now, so go try to find a copy of that and, um, and become the expert. Okay. So I would, I would call this a, um, a, a trico uh, folliculoma. The other thing you could think about here, because you're having all sorts of different um, types of hair follicle differentiation, there's an entity called pan folliculoma. And pan folliculomas basically have matrical, outer root sheath, inner root sheath, all of those different things combined together. And they can either be a, a nodule, like a cystic nodule down deep, um, or they can be uh, uh, along the surface, kind of hooked onto the epidermis. Um, they're also benign. So again, if you call this a cystic pan folliculoma, or if you say, oh, look at that little tiny baby hair uh, root developing in that cute, so pretty. Um, if you want to call it trico folliculoma or trico adenoma, or even trico epithelioma with cystic change, it's all benign and okay. So do not be afraid, right? There are other things that we should be worried about during the day. Um, this is not one of them. Save your worrying for the stuff that matters. Okay, enough hair follicle stuff. Let's change gears a little bit. Jay Wright? Yes. Uh, can you uh, go back and comment on the uh, proliferating pilometric soma um, versus the, the, the regular benign pilometric soma and the uh, 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 pilometric uh, 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 trixoma, the car uh, carcinoma of pilometric soma, how you differentiate between these three entities? So let's go back, pilometricoma. So I, I guess I don't really use the term proliferating um, pilometricoma. I feel like all of them uh, have proliferative activity. There are, and this is, this gets confusing because when you look in the literature, you'll find a lot of different statistics about how pilometrical carcinoma behaves, some of which says it's really bad and some of which says it's really indolent. And I think the reason for that is because the, the cases in the literature that are described are probably not a pure group. There are probably lots of things that are just pilometricomas that had mitoses that freaked someone out and they said, well, we think this is actually a carcinoma and look, it behaved well. And so I think that that's probably, it's a mixed bag. I think whenever you see the literature for an entity and it says, you know, the the chances of metastasis range from 10% to 90%, depending on the study. That means that some of those studies are probably describing different groups of things. And this is just a, I mean, I don't know, there's not one right answer, but I think that it's good that we need to learn to be cautious when we see that. So um, to me, the things that I, I look for, again, is if I, if I see pleomorphism, if I see atypical mitoses, um, those things point me towards malignancy. If I see sheets of obviously malignant cells that are not these like uniform these cells have a lot of mites, but they're very perfectly uniform, round. They look all like each other. I feel like that's pretty helpful that pilometricomas usually are going to have this. And there are times that if I see something that's kind of worrying to me and I've only got a partial biopsy, I can say the pilometricoma with atypical features and that, you know, I think this is probably just benign, but I can't see the whole lesion and it's got feature X, Y, or Z that's kind of worrying to me, or clinically they're worried about it. And then I say go and do a conservative excision. So we can see the whole thing. The one thing is in a lot of um, adnexal tumors, we like to use um, circumscription versus infiltrative growth to help us sort out benign or malignant. It's, it, it doesn't always work. There are malignant things that can be well circumscribed and there are things that look kind of infiltrative that are benign, like I've shown you so far today. So it doesn't always work, but if I see something like the, uh, a pilometricoma that's very um, deeply infiltrative, that's gonna worry me. The problem is, is how on earth do I tell if this is infiltrative or not, right? It's all fragmented and broken in pieces. So I feel like unless I have a complete excision, it's almost impossible to, to determine whether there is or isn't infiltrative growth in pilometricoma because you always have these little islands of tumor cells embedded in stroma that looks very reactive because they're ruptured open and there's all this response to the keratin. So to me, I feel like this is just a totally normal finding. And necrosis is a good question, but what is necrosis here, right? I mean, in any other thing, you would say this is necrosis. Those are 
cells that used to be alive that are now totally dead? They're probably not. It's probably like a variation of, of controlled apoptosis. But the point is, is there are dead cells here. So I think that in, in uh, lesions that normally make dead material, whether it be keratin or sebum, we have to be a little bit careful about necrosis. So I didn't really go into that, but in sebaceous tumors, if you see dead sheets of sebocytes, remember that's how sebaceous glands normally work, right? They make cells that get filled with lipid and then those cells die and that gets sloughed off and that becomes the sebum. And so that's the holocrine secretion method. So that, that is totally normal. If I see sheets of basaloid cells that are all dead in a sebaceous thing, that gets me a little more worried, but I still like to not use necrosis as my only thing. I guess the same thing here is if I, if I somehow saw pockets of coagulative, like tumor cell necrosis, that might worry me a little bit. Um, but you just, it's really, I think, hard to, I mean, it's hard to determine that because you're getting all of these different cells dying in a pyelometricoma normally because that's normally how they grow. So I feel like pleomorphism and atypical mitosis are the most helpful things to, to determine if something's a pyelometrical carcinoma or a clinical story that's really worrisome or the whole thing's out and you're getting islands of tumor way away in the normal subcutis away from the main tumor mass. Um, and yeah, you, you're so glad to be in PDPATH, that's fair. That I, I feel like all of the pyelometric carcinomas that I've seen, and, I, and I've not seen a ton of them, but I don't know, maybe a dozen or something, I think they've all been in adults, older adults actually. So again, you can have benign regular pyelometricoma in adults of really any age, but I, I would be really hesitant of making a, I, I guess I would say that skin adnexal carcinomas in general are, are extremely rare in childhood. Um, I'm trying to remember if I've even seen a true good example of a malignant skin adnexal tumor of any sort in a kid. I, I can't recall one off the top of my head. I'm sure it's been reported, but um, certainly it's, it, it's something I would be very, very hesitant before making a diagnosis like that. Okay, so here we got sheets of, of cells, kind of multiple nodules. Kind of some mucinous background that makes it look almost clear. Little tiny islands that look almost squamoid. Some ducts lined by kind of columnar or cuboidal cells filled with some secretion. Oh yes, true, I, I see that comment. Basal cell carcinoma in the setting of, of genodermatoses uh, like Gorlin syndrome. Yes, definitely you can see basal cells in kids um, in the setting of Gorlin syndrome. Here's some more ducts. And then what are these? What kind of structure are we looking at here? Anyone? You can type it in papillae, yeah. When you have little finger-like projections or micro papillae, technically, because we don't see the little uh, fibrovascular cores here, but you're right. They do look a little like orphan annie eyes. Okay. These little, uh, <clears throat> little floating islands obviously are papillae or micro papillae where the tips are cut off and floating in the space and we don't see the connection here. We can see the connection. Here we don't. So it's just a matter of tangential sectioning. And here, this is quite beautiful. Look at the secretion. It's all like a lava lamp or something. Really pretty. And then in these other areas are quite solid and they've got little tubules. So we've got solid nodules of relatively uniform epithelial cells, maybe a few mitoses, but pretty uniform cells, not real ugly. They've got some punctuated by tubules and ducts. And then we've got um, dilated um, cystic spaces that have papillae and, and or micro papillae protruding into the lumen. So we've got some takers here. We've got syringocyst adenoma papilliferum, tubulo papillary adenoma, which I think there's kind of two entities that really overlap closely, papillary eccrine adenoma and tubular apocrine adenoma. And in my mind, those two tumors get split out, but I feel like they have an awful lot of overlap. I kind of personally think of them as like kind of one entity. I don't know that everyone agrees with that, but in my mind, I think that they have so much overlap that it's hard to tell them apart. What else is in this differential? I haven't given you any clinical information. Look at these kind of squamoid islands 
or almost like squamoid morules, you know? Like, don't you get that in like, I haven't done general surge bath for a long time, but in, in, in there's something in endometrial carcinoma, you get little like swirls of keratinocytes sometimes. Anything else? What if I told you, well, does anyone, does anyone have a guess of where on the body this is? With practice, you can begin to, to guess this. We've got a tumor embedded in really dense, dense regular collagen. And look at that, see how wavy that is? Those wavy collagen fibers? That tells me what is this structure right here? What is this? And if you've seen one of my YouTube videos from January, you'll know. This is, is this a nerve or something else? Fascia, yes. This is either fascia, tendon, or ligament, okay? We don't see ligament that often unless you're doing bone pathology, but uh, tendon and fascia, dense regular connective tissue, looks like this. It's got dense collagen, bland spindle cells, but it has this tendency to bunch up like an accordion and get really, really wavy when, when we process the tissue. And my uh, fellow from a couple years ago, Ed Fulton, he, he said this looks kind of like, when it gets real wavy, it looks like ramen noodles. When you take them out of the pack, the little, little dried ramen noodles, the super, super waviness of it um, makes you think of, uh, of ramen noodles. And when he said that, I was like, this is brilliant. So I made a video on YouTube if you, if you want more information on this. And I've, I've named it in his honor, the ramen noodle sign of Fulton, um, so, uh, so that he can always be remembered for his contributions. Look at that. Oh, uh, look at how ramenoid it looks. I really want a bowl of ramen right now, actually. Not instant ramen, like good stuff. Okay, so ramenoid, I, I coined that today, right here. We've got evidence now. Okay, and once we put it on YouTube, then I'll put a paper and I'll cite it, ramenoid and I'll cite the YouTube video. And this is how the world works today. Okay, so anyway, where are we gonna have, you know, fascia or tendon? And then here's subcutis. How do I know this is subcutis? Because what's that? Yeah, there is fat, but you know, you can have fat next to tendon in the deep soft tissue of the body. But right here is the clue that even though no one's told me, I can tell we are right underneath the skin. We're in the subcutis because these are eccrine coils. Eccrine coils and ducts. When you see eccrine coils and fat this close to tendon or fascia, you're almost always in the acral skin, hands or feet. So you can usually use this to tell because you're gonna, because there's not really anywhere else in the body where the, the fascia and the tendons are that close to the skin and subcutis except in the hands and feet. Everywhere else, the fat layer is much thicker and you're not gonna be down anywhere near this big, thick bundles. So I think it's a really helpful clue when I see that dense regular connective tissue plus eccrine coils and fat right close to it, then I know I'm probably in the fingers, toes, hands, feet, wrist, ankle area. And the other clue, is that oftentimes when a tumor gets taken out from acral sites, it's irregular. It's not a nice circumscribed lobule. It's got little ratty kind of rayed borders. And the reason for that is that it's got all this dense regular connective tissue, tendon, sheath, and fascia. And also because the hand surgeon is going to be very delicate and gonna try to remove the tissue without taking any extra normal tissue because there's not much normal tissue to spare in the hands and feet. So I feel like it doesn't always work, but when I see a nodule of stuff that doesn't have any epidermis over it, just a blob of, of lesion with a lot of dense connective tissue and frilled edges, I right away wonder if I'm from the hands or feet. I think that it works actually pretty well, not all the time, but it's a pretty useful little clue. And then, oh, someone said differential to hydradenoma papilliferum. That would also be um, a, a thing to think of if we were in the anogenital area. But the one thing that no one's mentioned is the fact that we are actually in the finger of a middle-aged man. So now, what's this diagnosis? Changes everything. Oh, that part of the scan doesn't look very good. Let's go over here. Yes, very good. Roxana, this is digital papillary adenocarcinoma, formerly known as aggressive digital papillary adenocarcinoma, although the aggressive part got dropped a few years back uh, by most people. And this is a really, really important entity to know. It's relatively rare. Um, but it usually doesn't particularly look malignant. Um, it's cytologically oftentimes is bland. I've seen exceptions that had really marked atypia and necrosis, but the majority of cases that I've seen, and I see this probably a few times a year in my practice, 
um, because patients get referred for it. Um, they, uh, they usually look very bland and benign. And in fact, a lot of times they're nicely circumscribed. I've seen some that infiltrate. This one was a little bit more infiltrative looking, but I've seen mo many of them are like nicely circumscribed, kind of encapsulated looking cystic lesions that have cystic spaces with papillae or micropapillae, and then also have solid spaces, usually which are punctuated by little tubules, okay? Sorry, the, my uh, internet is getting a little slow. Let's see if I can find another area, like this. Solid area with tubules, and then other area with papillae in the cystic space. That's the classic combination of those two things to make this diagnosis. Basically, any papillary um, adnexal lesion on the hands or feet, this is the diagnosis that you should think of before anything and everything else. And really, I would be hesitant to call it anything other than this unless you are an expert in this area or are shown an expert. I, I would be very worried. I have rarely seen some of the things that I thought ended up being maybe benign but I'm, in general, what we think is that anything with papillae on the hands and feet like this has a potential to metastasize. So in the old days, they subdivided this into uh, papillary adenocarcinoma and papillary adenoma based on if there were atypical features or not. But what we found in the end was that even the ones that looked benign had the potential to metastasize. And it's, uh, I think, about 25%, I can't remember, 20 to 30%, somewhere in that range of cases in, in one of the larger recent studies that metastasize, and they can go to regional lymph nodes and also to the lungs. Um, most of the patients I've seen have actually done well, but I have I've seen cases that had distant metastases. So um, the, um, the other thing about them is that uh, they can be locally aggressive. So the, there are reports of patients needing to have an entire digit amputated. So obviously this is a, this is a problematic um, thing. They usually more often in men and they're often in the digits of middle-aged uh, men is the most, the most common uh, thing. But basically anytime you see um, a sweat gland tumor or an adnexal tumor on the hands and feet, this entity should always be in your mind as could it be that because it's one of those things that's easy to miss if you don't think of it and devastatingly bad potentially if you miss it. Okay, Not always, but it can be really bad um, if you miss it. Um, and the when it's got nice papillae, that's great. But some cases have very, um, a very sparse papillae and just have kind of cystic spaces and solid nodules. They can look very similar to hydradenoma sometimes. So I have seen hydradenomas on the hand and feet, but I always am very cautious and try to consider, is there any way it could be a digital papillary adenocarcinoma? Because there are solid variants that are pretty solid and only have a little bit of cystic change and don't have very many papillae. Um, one thing I find pretty helpful is this kind of sheet-like growth with little tubules in it. I feel like that is a, it's a kind of a look that this tumor has that you don't see as often in hydradenomas or other tumors. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it can even almost, it almost gives me a biphasic appearance that reminds me a touch of like synovial sarcoma or something. It sounds kind of crazy, but I don't know, it works for me visually. Maybe I've seen some where the, the cells get kind of oval and that have this very like streamy, very uniform oval look, and then have these little tubule or gland-like spaces in them, which is similar to what you see like in a biphasic synovial sarcoma. So I don't know, I've seen ones where it made me think of that at least. So really important entity to know. They don't have to have atypia. They don't even have to have much in the way of mitoses um, to be malignant. If I see something with cysts and papillaries like this and it's on the hands or feet, I'm gonna almost always end up calling it digital papillary adenocarcinoma. And uh, people do get sued over these. I've had lawyers contact me and ask me if, they, if I would testify and I told them I'm not really into that, but, but good luck to them anyway. Um, but um, that, it's a thing that happens and gets missed because it's pretty rare. So it's a thing I think we don't have enough awareness about this in pathology, and I'm trying to help uh, raise awareness. Okay, let's see, what's next? Let's skip down to this one. Okay. So where are we at on the body here? I'm watching that, yeah, scalp, good. You can tell it's scalp right away because you've got big antigen hairs that have their roots way down in the fat. Sometimes you can also see big deep hairs like this in the genital area or in the axilla. But most of the time when I see a lot of hairs and their roots are down deep, scalp, sideburn, somewhere close. And someone very nicely pointed out that it looks like an organoid nevus or, um, or a nevus sebaceous, depending on what name you like. And basically, yes, it's a hamartomatous process here. We've got um, 
uh, acanthosis of the epidermis. We got a lesion here I'll talk about in a minute, but we've got epidermal acanthosis. And we also importantly have normal hairs, normal hairs, hairs are gone. And then the normal hairs come back. So in organoid nevus, epithelial nevus, nevus sebaceous, all of these things kind of uh, overlapping, you often have um, a thickening or acanthosis of the epidermis, often with a kind of wart or seborrheic keratosis-like pattern. And then you have loss of the underlying hairs normally. So kind of a patch of alopecia it, along with the, uh, the lesion. And yes, and nevus sebaceous, for some reason, doesn't have an O in it. I imagine there's some long Latin story uh, there. But anyway, I, I always like to joke that it's, a, it's like a code word that if you, if you put the O in there, then the dermatologist will know you're not a real derm path. It's like a, it's a trick. So if you know there's a couple words in, in um, a dermatopathology of derm diseases that you have to leave the O out, like, or, or like lichen sclerosus. It has sclerosis with an I in the dermis, but the name is lichen sclerosus with a U. So I, again, I'm sure there's an actual good Latin declension-based reason for this, but it's kind of ridiculous. And it's okay. I've, uh, the O gets put in there because I cannot teach my dictating software to, to recognize. I just have to autocorrect it. So it's okay, don't, don't, don't feel shame, it's all good. All right, so that's a nice clue right away when I see loss of the hairs and it's from the scalp of a kid, right away I'm thinking of nevus sebaceous, then oftentimes again with the epidermal acanthosis. And another little clue that's sometimes present is you'll find um, apocrine or apocrine glands, whichever way you like to say it, underneath uh, the lesion. They're not always present, but when you see them, that's pretty helpful because apocrine glands don't normally exist in the normal scalp. They're normally limited to the anogenital area and also the glands of mole along the eyelids and um, random exceptions to that, but in general, you're not gonna see them on the scalp skin. So if I see um, apocrine glands, or sometimes it'll actually be glands that look like eccrine glands, but have kind of larger apocrine looking nuclei with little punctate nucleoli. So apoecrine glands, some people call them. Those are all nice clues for nevus sebaceous. I've got a whole video about nevus sebaceous that you can go and nerd out over if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, but here, what we're gonna talk about is this lesion. And <clears throat> it often arises in the setting of nevus sebaceous. And this is, um, this is an example of what? Yeah, this is scap, syringocystadenoma papilliferum. That's why we call it scap, because it's a ridiculously long name. What you have is cystic spaces with papillae. So similar to, I mean, in a way, that, that's that same kind of thing that we see in the um, in digital papillary adenocarcinoma. But the big differences here are, number one, this lesion essentially always arises from the epidermis and grows down. Whereas I don't think that I've ever actually seen a digital papillary adenocarcinoma connect to the epidermis that I can recall. They are, to me, always dermal or subcutis uh, based lesions that are separate from the epidermis, essentially always that I can, I mean, I'm sure someone's reported one, but I don't think I've ever seen one, and I've seen quite a few of those. Um, so syringocystadenoma papilliferum has this, um, this invaginating channels that come down and then kind of push down into the dermis. They're lined by double layer columnar or cuboidal cells that often have little kind of apocrine snouting on the surface. You get like kind of a little uh, basal layer and then the little apical layer here that has little snouts. See, isn't that cute little snouts? And then um, they, these, uh, these uh, bulging papillae that come into the lumen of these spaces. And in the stroma, in these papillae and around, usually you're gonna have tons of plasma cells. I'm not exactly sure why the plasma cells like this lesion so much, but they really do, they're usually present. So all of those things together are really helpful. And you, like I said, oftentimes if I see this, right away I start looking for nevus sebaceous in the background because it often grows in the setting of nevus sebaceous. And in fact, nevus sebaceous, because it's a hamartoma, it seems to be like a fertile, fertile garden for growing all sorts of different types of little adnexal tumor uh, weeds. So I've seen ones and sometimes I'll, I think I did put this in a report once, but and no one, I didn't get in trouble for it, but I said it was a, a nevus sebaceous with a melange of benign adnexal tumors, or maybe I said an assortment, I can't remember, but I did basically, instead of listing off, because it was a general surgeon or a pediatric surgeon, and I thought, instead of me listing syringocystadenoma papilliferum, desmoplastic trichelomoma, trichoblastoma, I thought these are all gonna sound highly scary to a non-dermatologist. I just said, this is a nevus sebaceous, and there's some benign adnexal growths in the background, and it's all good, no, no further treatment needed. Everyone was happy. 
So, um, so anyway, in Nevis Sebaceous, you know, stay on the lookout. You'll often find a variety of different little adnexal fun, fun goodies growing in the background, usually benign. Um, you know, in the olden days, people were concerned about basal cell carcinomas arising from uh, Nevis Sebaceous. I have seen uh, uh, one or two cases that I felt convincingly were true basal cell carcinoma, but I feel like the vast majority of basaloid things growing in the background of Nevis Sebaceous, in my experience, have been trichoepithelioma or trichoblastoma. So, um, and, and besides, even if they are basal cell carcinoma, you know, it's not like a basal cell carcinoma is going to be likely to cause this huge problem for the patient. So I sometimes see people worrying about, oh, we need to remove the nevus sebaceus because it could grow a cancer. Yes, it could. But I mean, even if it started changing, then you could take it out then. I, I think for people who want to remove nevus sebaceus, cool, no problem. But I don't feel like there's some real high risk of, of getting an aggressive malignancy. There are rare reports of apocrine carcinoma, and some other types of carcinoma growing in nevus sebaceus that were aggressive and did result in, in death. But we also see those rarely occur in totally normal skin, right? So I'm not convinced that the risk is terribly high. I have seen one, one example of a nasty African carcinoma that grew from nevus sebaceus, and I think I may have seen one squame, if I recall. And they were both in adults, so that it had long-standing nevus sebaceus. So in any case, just throwing that out there for your for your discretion. I, I know people, the derm residents always ask me this because it's supposedly it's something they're supposed to know for boards about what the most common tumor associated with nevus sebaceus is. And I don't actually know the answer because I don't know if the answer is supposed to be scap or if it's supposed to be trichoblastoma or what the actual proper answer is. There, I would say that the thing that I see most often is syringocyst adenoma papillotum. So for what it's worth. All right. Well, guys, that's about two hours worth. And I have a video on this, by the way, that you can go and watch if you're, if you're curious for more uh, examples of syringosis that I think um, I think two hours is about as much as my voice uh, can take. I got some cases to sign out, and I'm supposed to take my, um, my pathology board recertification exam. Um, so I'm going to probably try to do that today, too. So I got a big day ahead of me, but you guys have given me the 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 strength to keep going because uh this is really fun so thank you very much for inviting me i i'm honored to be virtually present in canada and to share some cases with you and uh, maybe we can do something like this again in the future so uh, please uh, please let me know how you liked it and um uh, i'll try to be a little bit more organized next time maybe with some powerpoint slides or something i always say that after every talk and then the next time i'm always scrambling the morning up to put it together it's, it's just how i roll so Anyway, thank you guys so much. And um, if you, um, if you, you know, I have a YouTube channel with a lot of videos and also I'm on Twitter and, and I have a Facebook page and I post a lot of content there. So for any of you who are not on Twitter, let me just throw out a pitch right now. Twitter is an amazing place to connect with other pathologists all over the world who you might not have met there. Are like, I actually keep a manual list of pathologists that I find on Twitter. There's like 6,500 on, on that so far. And um, if you're not on Twitter, you are really missing out on a really special, you know, uh, we call it the PATH Twitter family. It's a group of really incredible people from all over the world. And now more than ever in this time of social distancing, um, it is an amazing way to feel connected to the whole community of pathologists and also to help educate each other and the public. So um, if, you, if you need, I actually got a, a guide for how to do social media. I will share it with you now, actually. For any of you who don't know, this is a guide for how to set up a Twitter account. And um, again, it's, I'm always, pitching this to people, but I think that it's really amazing. If you think Twitter is just for like annoying waste of time stuff or politics, I mean, you can do those things with it if you want, but it's actually really an incredible place to network and to learn. So, okay, there's my pitch. Twitter's not paying me anything to say that. I just, I wanna, I wanna help all of you, um, uh, you know, do well through this, this time. So anyway, stay in touch. Let me know what I can do. And thanks again for having me. Bye-bye.